Uh, I'm so excited to be here. My name is Marisa. I'm so grateful to be here, and I'm having um, a profoundly wonderful time. It's really, it's really been uh, magical. Um, my work is informed by history and how it's understood and felt. Site specificity, questions of institutional critique, and reparation. More recently, I have found affinity within the emerging field of critical university studies, a discipline that critiques the university while remaining mindful of our place in it. I'm an assistant professor of studio art at the University of Virginia with a research focus on blackness. I'm originally from Philadelphia, where Jenna Osman writes in her poem essay, Public Figures, most figurative sculptures are clustered along the River Drive that is part of Frederick Law Olmsted's Fairmount Park. From their pedestals, they have a lovely static view of the river and trees. They loom above you. You map out a rescue plan. Osman takes photos from the point of view of the city's many statues. Osman's gesture is simple enough, but the photo of her seeing machine, which you see on the right, and her images of the statues and subjects of their gaze side by side helped to illustrate a philosophical concept I kept encountering in grad school and, and partially compelled my work. Object-oriented ontology, the inner world of historical objects. In particular, the ways that a black woman and her body can operate as a palimpsest or a seeing machine because of the ways she has literally and symbolically in been instrumentalized by Western cultures from middle passage through construction and beyond, reconstruction and beyond. I'm interested in how self-possession then complicates and interrupts this instrumentalization. Sometimes, as with Thomas Jefferson's views on Phyllis Wheatley, it is identified as an artificial intelligence. But I imagine the self-possessed object asking how she might misuse herself, that is, misuse the master's tool. In what ways might we, the transhistorical persons mistaken for objects, be able to dismantle the master's domain by self-inhabiting, by self-satisfying, in pursuit of our own happiness? I was initially drawn to monuments or anti-monuments by a need to imagine different points of view. For six years between 2013 and 2017, I made performance and video using the Sally Hemings persona. Monticello is 50 miles south of the town of Culpeper, the childhood home of my late maternal grandmother, her mother, and their family, a few of whom still live on the plot of land they once sharecropped. I wrote this in a grant proposal for funding from CalArts for a trip to Charlottesville for my, my thesis. I will be doing a performance at Monticello based on my research as well as my interest in collective and self mythologies, museological space, freedom and its opposites, race, gender, labor, sex, and love through an historical lens. I took a lot of direction from performative gestures I saw in Carrie Mae Weems' work, especially the kitchen table series and roaming. One character changes in relation to her context, a DIY Kuleshov effect. In 2013, I performed as Sally Hemings on the grounds of Monticello, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, in a dress of my own making. These are stills from a video of me singing the miracles you really got a hold on me and twerking to the song Goodies by Sierra. Enslaved to a narrative and subsequent works, I cover historical figures in the kind of provisional colonial drag that serves as a uniform for the historical interpreter, interpreter covering, covering improperly. It also recalls the living statue street performer. In many works I sing, solo renditions of pop songs, karaoke, or a cappella. For the ghost of Thomas Jefferson, I channel the kind of satirical performance found in carnival, ma black masking traditions in New Orleans and the West Indies. A cover can also be something that a viewer or listener sees or hears through, a filter, and of course, to cover is to report from a particular site. To the west of the dome room at Monticello is Sally Hemings' room, a former women's bathroom where Hemings and her children only have, rec have only recently be been reinserted into the landscape. Today, video plays on loop there, highlighting the details of her life in the words of her son, Madison Hemings. It is, 18, it is 1787, Thomas Jefferson sent for his younger daughter Maria to join him in Paris. His relatives chose Hemings, Sally, to accompany Maria as her maidservant. Sally was 13 or 14 years old. She stayed in France for two and a half years. Her, he desired to bring my mother back to Virginia with him, but she demurred. If she returned to Virginia, she would be re-enslaved. She refused to return with him. 
He promised, he promised her extraordinary privileges, made a solemn pledge. Her children be, would be freed at the age of 21 years. In consequence of this promise, she returned. She gave birth to a child. It lived but a short time. She gave birth to four others, and Jefferson was the father of all of them. How Hemings looked, how she was used, her privilege and lack of freedom undergird the gossip that surrounds her slender frame. Sally Hemings is Thomas Jefferson's late wife, Martha Wales Jefferson's half-sister. The French word, sal, the name one of Maria's French classmates uses to refer to Sally in a letter, translates to dirty, unclean, impure. She is then, as she is now, messy. Early video projects helped me sort through this mess with the help of other messy women. Women talking, gossip, gossiping, prostitute writing is in fact the origin in, of the word pornography. Women indulging and engaging themselves as subjects, these collage videos put Hemings in conversation with Monica Lewinsky, Oprah Winfrey, Whoopi Goldberg, and Marilyn Monroe. <clears throat> My work makes use of this multivocal feminism through collaboration and even recognizing the humanity of my own former selves and being more collaborative and kind toward them. The older I get, the more I become the woman who covers herself. As Carrie Mae Weems observes, I could not count on white men to construct images of myself that I would find appealing or useful or meaningful or complex. Throughout this work, I wrestled these are some books that I, that I really um, gained a lot from. I, I was gonna like read some parts of them, but you know, you can read them. You can pick them up at your local library. You can even download them online. Um, through this work, I wrestled with how to conduct ethical research, how to not support hegemonic log logics, and how not to act, trying not to pretend anything, and use the anachronism of myself as I am, dressed in period clothing, to draw the audience's attention to their own projections of authority or lack thereof onto a black woman past and present. This is the bathroom that got transformed into Sally Hemings' Hemings's room. Um, Sweet Chariot, an augmented reality vis vi video scavenger hunt, was an escape of sorts from this work. Using image recognition smartphone software, audiences uncovered a series of site-specific videos that revealed hidden monuments in the landscape of historic Philadelphia, moments that opened a window into the African-American struggle for freedom. It was part of Monument Lab with Paul Farbert, a high school classmate, always a few steps ahead and incredibly encouraging. The work... Uh, this, this video is, is one of eight videos featured, and it features movement performed by Newark-based artist and public historian Noel Lorraine Williams, inspired by West African and African-American mourning and celebratory traditions. She is the bird woman, a figure the video suggests is worthy of a monument herself. Congo Square, a 17th century burial ground for enslaved Africans and other outsiders, became a revolutionary war burial ground of which a statue to George Washington now stands in honor. In this video, I read a Labat B. Steptoe poem from Meditations on Congo Square. Other videos featured the poetry of Philadelphia poet laureate Leolando Wisher, my ninth grade English teacher. Monument Lab was transformative for me. I started to think about my practice as part of a laboratory. I could test and build on ideas. I could collaborate. What I had been trying to say with the Hemings persona, I could workshop with others. Um, in the, in the 19, 2019 escape room installation and performance titled Room, Hemings is joined by Phyllis Wheatley and Tituba, one of the first people accused of being a witch in Old Salem Village. They guide audiences through their narratives and gameplay. Most recently, I completed Unsettling Grounds, a pilot platform showcasing experimental and monumental works by black, brown, indigenous, and rural artists. Using this app, audiences uncover speculative monuments in, of hidden histories inspired by Charlottesville's woolen mill. These monuments, a wheel, a wigwam, the melting Jefferson, a loom, a sundial, and a dance party were crafted in collaboration with 10 other local Virginia artists and my team of developers based in Philadelphia. Um, this monument was fun. This is the Melting Jefferson. It might be my favorite, and it's melted by a conversation happening a f between four of us. It took a while to arrive at this, like, what melts the Jefferson monument, and it's four of us just 
shitting on Jefferson. Um, and it came out of drinking and thinking about, and everyone just going in on one of the members of the, our group is, is a, a descendant of Monticello. Um, we all live in Virginia. Some of us are reenactors or performers. And we were just going at, it was really anchored by Sandy Williams the fourth's idea that Jefferson is the first absentee black dad. And we all just uh, went into it from there. And um, it really restored a lot of joy um, to us to be able to like find ways that, that, that dialogue and discourse might, um, in this imagined world, melt down this, this, this monument that we see, we see a lot of. Um, in the spring of 2018, following the Unite the Right rally of August 2017, I was invited to be the rough and distinguished artist in residence at the University of Virginia. Department members were familiar with me and my work from my interviewing for a position I wasn't offered. Touring colleges as a teenager, I visited UVA and sat through an information session in which a bow-tied white man, the ghost of whom I sometimes think I see, warned us that acceptance was a very long shot. I did not apply. When I walked through the campus, um, Gia Tolentino writes in We Come From Old Virginia, her devastating essay on sexual assault and the complex blend of myth, fact, racial and sexual violence that undergird UVA culture, the sun was warm and golden and the white columned brick buildings rose into a bluebird sky. She says, I stepped into the lawn, UVA's centerpiece, a lush terraced expanse lined with prestigious student rooms and professors' pavilions, and I felt an instantaneous, overpowering longing. I was skeptical in 2021 when I was invited to apply for the assistant professorship at UVA that I now hold. It still seems like a long shot. My work since 2013 had brought me back to the Jefferson landscape, asking questions of anti-monumentalism anti and black iconoclasm in the shadows of the master's house. UVA is a site of reckoning. The history and ongoing impact of slavery and white supremacy reverberate in a built environment that is both carceral, observed by Angela Yvonne Davis, and palatial. People bound in chattel slavery built and maintained the flagship state university that Thomas Jefferson envisioned. Jefferson modeled the rotunda the academical and the academical village after his own home, a plantation. The campus has at least three black burial grounds rediscovered in the last two decades. West of the rotunda is a fourth. The anatomical theater used for anatomy instruction included a charnel, a place where cadavers were disposed of and burned. The anatomical theater is the only Jefferson designed building at the university to have ever been torn down. The site is marked by a low stone marker easily mistaken for some protruding underground infrastructure. Just as well, the Special Collections Library is buried underneath. And very recently, um, a piece of the Berlin Wall was there. And I was convinced that the Berlin Wall was, it was just making a kind of um, partition, like that, such that you couldn't approach this terrible little plaque um, that was marking uh, the anatomical theater, and, and it was just returned to its owner. I think this person must be collecting Berlin Wall pieces and putting them up in, you know, I don't know, in front of other sites. I, I cannot get over how much I think that wall, those walls are being used to um, point to some other conflict in order to, to block, you know, block a conflict at home. Um, the archive contains graphic images of UVA students posing cavalierly with cadavers. Consider this your trigger, trigger warning. A child's corpse cradled jauntily by a grinning young man undermines a long running narrative that subjects or props in the theater were sourced exclusively from penal events. It is now more widely understood through primary sources that the same archive through the same, in the same archive that most of the bodies belong to black people, stolen from graves throughout Virginia. Such dehumanizing dynamics in the name of science paved the way for UVA to become an epicenter of early 20th century eugenics. Last fall, I created Bag Lady after the Erica Badu song, an interdisciplinary course that took up questions of the embodied archive. I planned to introduce concepts and creators I value, Audre Lorde, Octavia Butler, Metonymy, Bernard Schumi, Derive, Stuart Hall, and Bell Hooks, and see where and how students might wander with them in directions I had not considered. My department graciously allowed me to teach the class with an enrollment of only two young men, Justin and Ryan. Because I had been offered some grant money for student engagement and needed to submit a proposal to take advantage of it, that became one of our first assignments as a class. 
we proposed the creation of an interdisciplinary archive of conversations that would transpire around a dinner table. We hoped that the manner of conversation as pedagogy would impel us to critical engage, critically engage with ideas through their integration with everyday life. We imagined these meals being site specific. We proposed one for the Kitty Foster site, the home of a free black woman, the foundation of which was discovered during campus ex expansion and turned into a monument by architect Walter Hood. The Omni Hotel, under which Sally Hemings remains are rumored to be buried and the anatomical theater. We collaborated on just one meal, a birthday party for my one-year-old before the shooting deaths of three black students on our campus by their former friend disrupted all normal activity that semester. We did create a book, a bag, a textbook prototype for the course which successfully seeded and continues to propagate thought and action. With the next intimate cohort, the proposal was dramatically reinterpreted. In the spring of 2023, I worked with Emily and Laura, again, only two students enrolled, in what was now cross-listed as a performance art and installation class. We read Gia Tolentino's devastating essay, learned from our provisional textbook about the anatomical theater, and tried to piece the, together the details of a night out in which one of the two students feared she'd been roofied. An idea was hatched. Together, we conceptualized, scripted, and cast ourselves into uncomfortable roles as teacher and students in the anatomical theater. We mounted a broad critique of the cannibalistic social structure of the school, with a practical starting, starting point being that the pers personal is and has always been political. We set out to exercise our own ghosts, practice some self-reflection, while holding mirrors up to the university. We conducted research in the special collections and other campus libraries. We workshopped ideas over snacks in my home office. We visited hallowed sites on campus and around town. We brought visitors to the classroom to give us feedback on our script drafts and rehearsals, and we talked about our struggles to digest certain histories and ideologies. We learned from dark humor, protest theater, about the cakewalk and black iconoclasm. On our journey, we drifted around the theater as a subject and site, looking for ways it might still serve as a place of autopsy, from the Greek to see for oneself. The final performance was well attended and well received, a live dissection of the edible effigy of Thomas Jefferson, the man, father, slaveholder, and university's founder on the site of the anatomical theater. An epic backdrop, a somewhat edible cadaver, a 3D printed phallic column, a search for Jefferson's unexplained debt were hits with an audience drawn to the site from grounds and beyond. The theater of the anatomical theater is an ongoing exper experiment. I have, been, I have taken it up as a professional research project. As a member of the, university's, the, pres the university president's task force on the digital contextualization of statues and monuments on campus, I'm part of a committee charged with creating a tool for contextualizing seven monuments and memorials. The anatomical theater should be among them, but is not. In that service role, I was enlisted to teach a seven-week course to first-year students that starts next week. We'll be creating a tableau with additional characters added to the anatomical theater classroom. Students will have to find or invent these characters, drawing on research and their own histories. I was preparing my syllabus and assembling a video for the organization that had administered the grant when, on Tuesday, September 4, uh, 12th, I noticed that the images of the anatomical theater in Virgo, the online database for the special collection, had gone blurry. Ryan, one of the bag lady boys, had created an interventionist project, Action Do, which was receiving some attention, but not before I noticed the censored images. Ryan is staging his intervention remotely from Venice, where he's studying abroad, so we were texting. Checking on you, there's been a lot of murmuring about action now, and also what I was told would be disciplinary action, but then I didn't hear any follow-up. Oh, wait, can you tell me any more? A colleague reached out to me. She said she was very upset by the images. These are, uh, these are Ryan's images that he put up around campus. Um, she thought they were neo-Nazi attacks. I told her they were not. She said they made her very upset. She said that she was going to see a therapist because of how upset she was, dot, dot, dot. The colleague said that she had told deans about it and she had taken pictures. She sent me the pictures and she said she would CC me when she communicates with the deans, but she never CC'd me. Hmm, oh snap. Wait, thanks for sharing all this. Wow, incredibly interesting. Do you know if they visited the page? Because there's a lot of info on the page. Dot, dot, dot. Another thing, I'll end with this. The small special collection website, Virgo, has the photos of the anatomical theater. They were visible a few weeks ago and then the graphic photos became blurry. Oh snap, really? That's insane. That's profusely interesting and insane. Wait, thanks for all this info. This makes me think I'm going crazy, I said. The fact that they're blurred, 
Ryan asks. I think the, do you think the flyers had an effect? Not sure, but the blurring happened after the, before the flyers. Mm, okay, interesting. Are there any other images that really stood out to you? Um, I'm interested in a photo, and people should check this out. I have, I'm curious what people think. I'm interested in a photo in which you can see the anatomical theater in the background, and in the foreground are white children attending the university's outdoor Montessori school. The thing that strikes me is because it just contains so many layers, like these white kids are going to become white supremacists. Meanwhile, and or nearby, there are skeletons of black children. UVA only admitted women in the 1970s. I intend to explore the ways patriarchal censorship relates to and might be co-constitutive with the archetype of the feminist killjoy and the appearance of women on the record. Along with the self-professed object woman, the feminist killjoy disrupts what Thomas Jefferson termed the boisterous passions of slavery, the unremitting despotism of slave owners, and the degrading submissions of the enslaved, Sadia Hartman writes. Sarah Ahmed's description of the feminist killjoy, and in, as introduced in her 2010 book, The Promise of Happiness, disrupts heirs of happiness in a context where social norms call on participants to uphold them. This work on feminism, surveillance, and surveillance, and their adjacent vectors is central to my work with collaborator Kim Bobier. Since 2019, we've been working together to convene methodological feminist forums in writing and in person at the intersection of critical race theory and surveillance studies. Our exhibition, which opens on February 23rd in Ruffin Gallery at the University of Virginia, is the culmination of research and theory developed through creative practice and conversation. It invites visitors to navigate the university's white, colonial, cishet, paternalistic history through specific surveillance domains. We will feature the work of at least six artists from across the country, as well as my students and members of my local Unsettling Grounds artist cohort. Meanwhile, the theater of the anatomical theater takes shape in my mind. It will operate as a monument to the victims and lessons of that grisly classroom. I will expand the performance, finding, inventing, and calling on people from the margins, inviting them to chime in, speak up, and move to the front of the classroom. I will assemble a cast of ghosts, a cast of ghosts to populate the classroom. Together, this cast of persona will join in conversation across time and context on the subject of the dissection, Thomas Jefferson. It will be an augmented reality performance unfolding in chapters buried in the pages of a book. I love what a book can be, a textbook, a model for reparative practice. A book can become a school of thought like the theater of theater or pedagogy of the oppressed. With the resurgence of book banning, can a book sneak liberative tools into the master's house, provide others with the tools to dis dismantle from within? Wouldn't it be fun to see it published by the University of Virginia Press? Because the set and setting are virtual, anything can happen. I will draw on what I've learned from my past and past works. I can revisit Avery Gordon, Lisa Woolfork, Rebecca Schneider, and Re Diana Taylor and others to explore how ghosts, improper reenactment, repetition and repertoire, rituals of embodiment might illuminate and transform this under-recognized historic site. Um, P.S. As for ghost writing, Syracuse professor George Saunders wrote to me, very nice of him to write me back, the only thing that comes to mind is how important specificity is, a ghost being, of course, a former person with a particular flavor of mind and certain memories prioritized over others. The ghost of Sally Hemings will be the teacher, provisionally prepared to answer questions. She's a feminist killjoy. Our favorite friend-loving founding father is, of course, dead on the table, and about this she feels some type of way. In being challenged by a diversity of learners, she reconsiders the reasons why she holds the positions she does in the first place. She tries to remember how she got there. She worked to decolonize herself, her classroom, her syllabus, her parenting, her sex life, her beauty standards, her relationship with the land, her writing and speech patterns, her mental health. But she still finds herself here with a scalpel in hand, digging into a man she hates, thirsty for blood. Does she love her work or hate it? It is, is it, like always, as with everything, a both and situation, messy. This work is about the struggle to find freedom, create freedom, plant seeds of freedom within structures of captivity. The work aims to restore humanity and dignity to black people and especially the messy women, women who have lost something or someone. It deals with the absence of burial ground, the black holes, the living dead, and the phantom killjoys. There is an element of epigenetic research. I want to develop new strategies for reading the wound, where I live and in my body. Humor is a salve in my work. This is serious play, but healing is at its heart. Thanks. <laughs>